great. We're so glad that you've joined us for this vaping panel. This evening is really a collaboration of many partners in our community, Bloomfield Hills High School, and most of the administration is here tonight. We have the Birmingham Bloomfield uh, Community Coalition here as well, the Bloomfield Township Police, and Bloomfield Youth Assistance. So as we just saw, the news is dire. It's hard not to turn on your TV or open your tablet and see news about vaping these days. And what our hope is in bringing the community together here tonight is to be able to figure out how we can all come together as students, parents, and as a community to address the issue. Now, it is dire and it is scary, but we all want to be sure and touch on a couple points of hope. The first time we held this vaping event was in March of 2019. And as we were preparing for that, we had a couple of ideas and we were like, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could affect some change? And two of those things that were on our wish list have already occurred. One, at that time, it was only illegal to sell vapes to minors but it was not illegal for the minors themselves to possess or use them. That has now changed, and there's an ordinance on the Bloomfield Township books that makes that illegal. That's a huge step in the right direction. Secondly, at that time, when a student was caught vaping at the high school, and I know we have people here from lots of different school communities, but this is specific to the high school, it was an automatic three-day suspension. Now, at the beginning of this year, the high school, in conjunction with all of us that you see, has launched a pilot program that's an alternative to suspension for vaping. And it's a month-long program that helps students uncover perhaps why they turned to vaping in the first place, as well as educating them about the dangers therein. So, without further ado, I'll introduce our panel. We have Carol Mastrioni, from the Birmingham Bloomfield Community Coalition. Carol's the executive director of this 501c3 organization that takes a research-driven, youth-led approach to substance abuse prevention, health, and wellness. BBCC and its Youth Action Board provide education, tools, activities, and support to help youth rise above life's challenges by making informed decisions about their safety health and wellness, as well as encouraging adults to thoughtfully support them. Carol is very well certified. She is a certified trainer for the Covey Seven Habits for Highly Effective Teens, Iowa State's Strengthening Families Program, and she serves on the Alliance of Coalitions for Healthy Communities, Oakland County Vape Work Group. All of these programs help bring a comprehensive fo focus for parents, students, and educators. Next, I'd like to introduce John Seco. John is the Director of Sports Medicine at Bloomfield Hills Schools. He's been a certified and li licensed athletic trainer for 13 years with experience in high school, collegiate, and professional sports. The last nine have been here at Bloomfield Hills High School. Between 2012 and 2016, John worked with the BBC as the Student Athlete Project Coordinator, directing drug prevention programs centered around student athletes in Birmingham and Bloomfield Hills. In 2013 and 2014, John was awarded the Drug Free Sport Continuing Education Award for athletic trainers who work in or assist with drug prevention and education. Our third panel member is hopefully going to be able to make it. He had some police business that he had to attend to, and that's our school liaison officer, David Vankerkove. A huge thank you to the Bloomfield Hills administration who is here tonight. Kathy McDonald, associate principal, is with us in spirit, was not able to be here. We have Charlie Hollerith, principal of Bloomfield Hills High School, Jessica Lapone, associate principal of Bloomfield Hills High School, and David Reed Nordwall, associate principal of Bloomfield Hills High School. And I am Denise Sullum. I'm the president of Bloomfield Youth Assistance, and I will be your moderator this evening. Thank you. Carol. Whenever I do a vaping presentation, I really like to start with this first basic question. 
And just with a show of hands, how many people know smoking cigarettes is bad for your health? Okay, let's look around. It looks like everyone has raised their hand, correct? Got that right? Remember that for later, okay? So what is vaping? One of the things I want to make sure be, that we are all on the same page in terms of a definition that we're going to be using tonight, because I know we all have different ideas of what vaping is. In this one I really like, it's from the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse, and vaping is the act of inhaling and exhaling the aerosol. So it's not smoke, it's aerosol. Aerosol, it's a vapor produced by an e-cigarette or similar device. The term is used because these devices do not produce tobacco smoke, but rather an aerosol often mistaken for water vapor. It actually consists of fine particles. Many of these particles contain varying amounts of toxic chemicals which have been linked to cancer as well as respiratory and heart disease. So we're going to hear a little bit more about this later. And this comes from the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse and is going to be probably one of the only slides I read. So what is a vape and how is it used? How did we get here? And it's really interesting because this is the life cycle of e-cigarettes. So back in about 2007 is when e-cigarettes came out. And they actually were for those who are adult smokers who wanted to quit tobacco. So now remember how I asked everyone if you knew that smoking cigarettes was bad for your health. Everyone raised their hand. You have to understand cigarette companies, tobacco companies, is a business. So that was one of the most um, highly successful public health campaigns ever in the United States. So what do you think happened in terms of cigarette smoking and in terms of sales of cigarette products? It went down. So like any business, you want to figure out ways that you can keep yourself in business and what else you can do. Now, the cigarette companies have been, the tobacco companies for a long time, looking at marijuana in terms of replacing that with cigarettes. However, you know, when they started out with the cigalites, when they noticed that that was starting to catch on, because you think about it, look at those first ones. It looks just like a cigarette, right? Because people who smoke cigarettes, people already see them smoking cigarettes, so they don't need something that's small, that's slick, that they can hide. They just want to quit smoking. However, they noticed things started catching on, so then they moved to the variations. They started to look like highlighters. And then we got to vape pens and finally to mods, uh, which we're going to get into all of those. So just so you can see, now if you've ever heard of ENDS, it's the Electronic Nicotine Delivery System. And I just want to point out a couple of things that one, they can be odorless. And two, um, some of the e-cigarettes, they're actually used for other things like playing music. So once again, why would someone who's trying to quit smoking, who's an adult, who everyone knows they smoke, need something that looks anything like that? Look at that, the USB drive. Very, I mean, how would you even know? Now, the components is really where it's gotten interesting in terms of these e-cigarettes and vape pens, because each component plays a key role. So the battery. This is one thing that, as technology keeps advancing with the uh, vapes, with the two different kinds, the pods and then the mods, is that the battery keeps getting stronger. What ends up happening, the more that the liquid is heated up, the more it is releasing those chemicals, and the more someone can have an experience with this. You have the atomizer, your e-liquid, cartridge, aerosol. And this is just one example of all of that put together. So now think about that too. Why, if it's for an adult who's trying to quit smoking, would they need a stronger battery? I mean, aren't they trying to reduce their nicotine intake? Just throwing out some questions for you to ponder. So we're going to talk about Juul, since this is really the most popular one by our youth. And just dive in really quickly on this. So the first thing is, I'm going to show you the actual patent for nicotine salt e-cigarette. Right there, you see in red, they stated in 2015 that this is a method of providing cigarette-like 
nicotine delivery. I don't know about you, but I have some trust issues already with this company named Juul. Why would they lie? Why have they been telling us all these years that it's only water and flavoring? Right here, through the government, they said right there, you see it says nicotine. So once again, it's only water and flavoring, right? Let's take a look. These are all of the different chemicals that have been found in the various e-cigarettes. And then these ones that are gonna pop up in yellow are the ones that in 2012, the FDA came on their harmful or most harmful list. All of these have been found. And you have to think about it in terms of when you vape, unlike when you smoke a cigarette, you have oxygen that comes into play. When you're vaping, that aerosol, it's a direct hit to your body, to your lungs. All of that's going right inside of you. It's not going out. So where else can you find these chemicals? Well, we have the propylene glycol. That's an antifreeze. Acetone is a nail polish remover. Ethylbenzene is in paints and pesticides. Formaldehyde, I do believe they put that in dead people. Nicotine is cigarettes. And then rubidium is the fireworks. So, and this is one thing, I mean, we have really smart young people today. I know all you guys in this audience right now, you're smart, you want to succeed, you want to have great lives, you work hard, you play your sports, to do, you do well in them. It just doesn't make sense to me why you would want to put all this in your body when you're working so hard to succeed and be your best. So in the flavors, once again, there's over 7,000 flavors. Chicken and waffles, I know. You're going to tell me that if you're quitting smoking, an adult who had been smoking cigarettes, that they need 7,000 flavors so that they can quit smoking? It just doesn't make sense. See, once again, let's get back to the big business. Let's get back to all of the hands that were raised here in terms of you know that cigarette smoking is bad for your health. This is big business preying on the young and on the vulnerable. And they did a darn good job, too. So there's two different types of e-cigarettes. Let me just pull this all up. The one on your left, there's salt-based and there's free-based nicotine. These are just the way the nicotine is delivered into your system. There are pods that are not refillable, and then there's a refillable tank. However, I can tell you that those not refillable pods, um, our young people know how to get them open, and they'll fill them up with straight THC, which I want to bring up. I'll bring it up in a moment. Let's, let's continue on with the jewel. We'll stick with jewel. So I don't need to see a squirrel yet. So anyways, how much is that? If you notice right there, it says mango, 5% strength. Well, it's like 5% strength of what? They want you to be confused. So... This ends up being 59 milligrams. OK, so what? Well, let's see. So there's a pod. And 59 milligrams is extremely high. So one pod, one jewel pod, is the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes. So let's just step back for a moment. We have young people who I can, I'll be showing you um, a slide in just a few moments in terms of um, Birmingham Bloomfield Community Coalition, we've been doing a biannual teen substance use and mental health survey since 2005. We survey all of the 8th through 12th graders in Birmingham Public, Bloomfield Hills Public, and then possibly uh, private school. And so that's five to 6,000 students we are surveying. So our data is very statistically significant. And I can tell you that cigarette smoking is so low. We know for a fact. So what's happening now is young people who have never smoked cigarettes, they're getting this nicotine hit like their body has never experienced before, number one. Number two, when you smoke a cigarette, there's a very obvious beginning and end to it. However, when you have a pod, it all depends on the person. How hard are you taking a hit off of it? And how often are you using it? So it's not, you're not as consciously aware when you're done with that. And then that's a whole pack, a whole pack of nicotine in your system. So let's get over to now that we have this wonderful recreational marijuana. And a lot of times you'll have THC in the vaping devices. And this is where you've heard a lot in the news 
that where some of the problems have come in because of the oils and other things in there. I need you to also be aware that Michigan is the only state in the United States with legalized recreational marijuana that has no cap on how much THC can be in a product. Other states have a cap, so they can be getting pure THC. So let's put this in perspective. Back in the 70s and 80s, THC is the part of the marijuana plant that gets you high. It was only 4%. THC was only 4% of a marijuana um, of the marijuana used back then. Today, it's 45 plus percent, and then when you get to these waxes and oils, it is um, pure, 100 percent, 90 to 100 percent. Your body is not made to take this in, number one, and Jen's going to really get into that. And number two, what ends up happening is because you don't know it's not being uh, federally manufactured under regulations, you have no idea what's in there. So when we have a student who ends up passing out from vaping, you bring them to the hospital, the doctors really don't know, and the medical team, they don't know how to treat them because they don't know what's been put in their bodies. So this really puts everyone in a conundrum and really puts lives at risk. So vape use in our community. As I said, BBCC, we do the biannual survey every two years. So we're coming up December 2019. So this was December 2017, and this is aggregate. Aggregate meaning these are all the answers we had from over 5,000 8th through 12th graders. And the reason I'm showing you this is because on the far left, it shows that alcohol is the number one drug of choice. This has always been that way, even across the whole nation. Alcohol is always the number one drug of choice for youth. I can say, and based on what we've he heard from the teens we work with, that it'll be very interesting to see if, in this survey, if vape doesn't eclipse it. And if you notice, vape's number two, and this is past 30-day use, and it's just a way that you can uh, measure your information as well as compare it to national data. And right there, it's at I think it's like 19, 18.2%. And it passed up marijuana, which marijuana was actually cranking a little bit um, ever since the legalization of the medical marijuana. Now when you compare 2015 to 2017, it looks like a, a, a rocket ship is going off. So on the left, we have past 30-day use. And then on the right, we have past year use. And you can just see there's middle school in purple, high school is um, gold, and then combined is green. Uh, we anticipate these numbers are going to be even higher this December. And then we also look at what influences a young person to use. Now, influences can be a positive or a negative thing in terms of making a good or not so great choice. So we're tied for number one is perceived friends use, friend disapproval, and perception of harm. Well, we already know the perception of harm is there's no harm. It's a vape. It's safe. It's water and flavoring, although that's starting to change a tad bit now, but not too much. Now, friends, this is the immediate circle of friends that a young person has. They have the most influence over them next to a parent. Um, and just, you know, perceived typical student's use. Um, the only thing we also, because we do some mental health questions, we're able to cross-tabulate and see if there's any correlation between vape use and other things. And this time around, we did see anxiety and stress. Now, as I said, we do look at mental health. And just to give you an idea in terms of the stress level our young people are under, on the far left, the question is actually a depression screening question. And it says, during the last month, did you ever feel so sad or hopeless every day for two weeks or more um, in a row that you stopped doing your usual activities? Remember I said it was a little over 5,000 surveys, student surveys we used? Well, right here we have combined a little over 1,000. So we have about one-fifth of our 8th through 12th grade students in both the Birmingham and Bloomfield Hills public communities that are feeling that way um, at any point in time. And also, when we do our survey, we do it at the exact same time every year, so all of the other variables stay the same. Now, on the right, it's just more of a general stress and anxiety question. And basically, over the last month, did you find 
that was difficult to do your work, take care of things at home, and get along with other people. We're at almost 2,600 students at any one time. Well over half of students are feeling that way, and we anticipate this, too, to be going up higher. One of the things is, is we listen to our Youth Action Board teams to get a barometer on what's going on in the community with our youth. And it was in 2013 that we started hearing a lot of talk about stress and anxiety. And so this was the time that we put that on the survey. Also that year, we added hookah. Now, it wasn't until 2015 that we added vapes. We're in 2019, almost 2020. So BBCC, we have been working on preventing vape use since 2015. That's four years. And look where we're at. It's just incredible. It's like, how can a smaller grassroots nonprofit compete against a multi-billion dollar international industry of which Juul has 75% of? So where are vapes used? They're really used everywhere. Now this picture may look a little familiar. It's actually taken at the Bloomfield Township Library. I was on my way in in December for our holiday Youth Action Board uh, meeting, and I looked down, and what was there? A vape cartridge. There's a jewel, you can see it blown up. Um, it, so it really is everywhere, at home, school bathrooms, libraries, in cars, at events, everywhere. So how do youth obtain vapes? Well, older sibling or friend, like many other substances, parent, yes, there are parents who buy their um, child vape equipment, and I can tell you because there's a number of schools across southeast Michigan that when a student gets caught vaping, the parent will come in and be very upset with the associate principal because they paid good money for that vape and they want it back. True story. Retailers in the area, as, you, as you've probably heard, they're making money. They're in the business to make money. Money is an addiction just like everything else. And so they get hooked in. It, I just don't understand it, but we had that happen too when we had all the K2 going on in 2012. You know, it's like what to them, to the retailers, I'm going to make my money while I can. If I have to dump all this stuff, they don't care because they've already made hand over fist in terms of the money. And then finally, the dealer. And this is more for our middle schools. Uh, we know that dealers, a lot of times they could be maybe high school students who are addicted to vaping, um, not only the nicotine part, but the THC in others. And that's how our middle school students get it. Then there's also good old Amazon, Amazon Prime. And this is where it is, you'll never notice because what um, some young people will do is they collect their Amazon gift cards. They pull them together. You go and you order your little um, vape kit, your cartridges, and then you, it comes in an Amazon box. Who's going to think any different? Or you always get something from Amazon. And this just gives you an idea of what the starter kits were, as well as one of the Youth Action Board's messages that they came up with to try and combat this. And if you look at this, once again, vaping e-cigarettes are used intended, every, intended for adults to quit smoking cigarettes. I don't know about you, but if I was uh, smoking cigarettes, I don't think I would need a slushie or a Hello Kitty. They are not only targeting our teens, they're targeting our younger children. Once again, this is an industry that tobacco sales were going down and they need to revive in some way. And this is why I'm showing you this. Looks like a juice box, right? Not so much. This actually has um, juice in it to refill your vape device. Juice box. Young Little kids going to look at that. They're going to remember that. Or they might accidentally grab that. It's another thing, too, with the edibles we have around. They can't tell the difference. So what to look for and understand? Well, first of all, lots of chargers. Kids constantly needing and looking for chargers. Sweet smelling scents uh, that you don't recognize. This one gets me every time my daughter, she feels I'm hopeless. I'm like, it smells so good. Mom, it's like, oh, I should know better by now. <laughs> um, 
New constant or heavy coughing, generally one of the first things that you're going to notice. Uh, the glassy look to the eyes or the person being off. Going to the bathroom a lot. If you're doing college tours, your child does not have a bladder infection if they keep going to the bathroom, okay? There's also an increase in water intake because of the propylene glycol in it. It gets you kind of a cotton mouth. And then ants in the bedroom. This is not a new band. What ends up happening, if you notice ants in your child's bedroom, it's because they're attracted to the juice in the vape cartridges. So where else? Where do you conceal them? Pockets, pillowcases, cars, backpack, pens, markers, books. iPhone box, perfect place. Who is going to think twice to look in an iPhone box? How about these stash cans? Look at They're all regular things that you would have in your house. Guess what? They have a hidden compartment at the bottom. Once again, available on Amazon. Um, candy wrappers. You see candy wrappers around, you just wrap your stuff in it. You're not going to think twice. Makeup containers. Could look like a lipstick, could look like an eyelash wand. Belt buckles. They sell them with special compartments. And then, of course, there's the crotchy net, which generally happens when you're in school getting ready to get caught. And then think about, then they're going to be using it after. So that is really gross. <laughs> TMI, huh? <laughs> Anyways, this is something that just came out a few months ago. And they're hoodies. And they actually have the vape devices right in the drawstrings. And on top of it, this really set me on fire, is I know that that little girl did not model for this. She probably modeled for something else. But how dare these people sell this, because it says, I don't know if you can see this, I have to get really close to see it, it says, born to vape, forced to work. This is the message we want to give our kids, born to vape, forced to work. Is that, is that really, is this what we're supporting? No, no, we should be angry here. We really should. As a community, we need to take, we need to take our children's health back away from these people who are just praying, praying on them. Also, backpacks now in the strap, they have little um, vape things, so they can just be going down the hall, doing one of those, getting a little hit. Has anyone heard of third-hand smoke? Okay. Oh, good. Something new. So anyways, there's actually with vaping something called third-hand smoke, and here's how it works. There's our couch. Here's the vaporizer, the vape cloud, which if you've ever seen one of those go off, when you're driving by a car, you see this big smoke that you can barely, it's not even smoke, it's a vapor, barely see. Well, what ends up happening is, is because it's in that aerosol, it's thicker, it sticks to things. And then what ends up happening is our pets and our little children in that, they can touch it, they put it in their eyes, they could put it in their mouth. Old versus new. Isn't it interesting that we have our, our big cigarette companies, they launched right into this. As a matter of fact, we've seen the placeholders that all those companies have had for marijuana, too. And look at this. Isn't that interesting? That's a jewel pod. Doesn't it kind of resemble the Marlboro, who is owned by Altria, who purchased a 28% stake in Jewel in December, and who is now the president of Jewel, the gentleman from Altria. It just doesn't, you know, it's like it's interesting how things just kind of when they unfold and you look at them with a little bit more discernment, it just makes you kind of wonder how long this was being planned. I'm showing you this slide just because, now remember I mentioned that BBCC, us, we also work with 18 other prevention coalitions in Oakland County, in the state, we work with several as well as within the, na the nation. And we've been working since 2015 on vaping. It wasn't until September of 2018 that the FDA took any sort of measures against those who were selling these or manufacturing vapes. That's how many, three? over three years later, okay? And here are just some of the recent headlines. It ended up getting so bad starting in about June or so. I actually made a document that I've shared with a number of people on the team 
um, just of all the vape headlines. So for example, I'm not gonna go through all of them because there's so many. So July 28th, teens, two pot a day, jewel addiction caused massive stroke. Uh, July 27th, eight Wisconsin teens hospitalized with severe lung damage due to vaping, doctors suspect. August 22nd, teen spent 10 days on a ventilator after his lungs failed. Doctor thinks vaping is to blame. Mysterious vaping lung injuries may have flown under regulatory radar. Vaping lung injuries top 1,000 cases as deaths rise to 18. This was October 3rd. This one's October 17th. We're up to 33 deaths. And then October 24th, 34 deaths. We are now at 35 deaths and counting. We have over 1,600 people who are impacted by what the CDC has called EVALI. And it stands for e-cigarette or vaping product use associated with lung injury. We have young people as young as 13 years old who are having these issues. And we've had people from 17 to 75 die from vaping-related injuries. A lot of the things I'm going to talk about tonight are nothing new. We've learned how detrimental and how terrible smoking can be. In 2015, we saw cigarette smoke was going down. And in fact, this was the generation in which smoking was going to go away. This was the generation in which smoking was going to go away. However, we are now faced with this new issue with vaping. So a lot of things I'm gonna cover are really nothing new. A lot of the same health concerns when it comes to vaping are the same as smoking. So people who have smoked for 20, 30, 40 years experience the same health concerns and, health and, and uh, diseases that people who smoke for simply a year, two years, three years. And we're gonna go over those things. Like I said, a lot of these things are not new. They're very old, They're, we, we know these things. It's just now we're faced with them a lot faster and a lot sooner because of the potency of vaping. So what are we gonna look at? We're gonna look at brain health. We're gonna look at the brain damage and the way nicotine and vaping affects a young age, a young person. We're gonna look at lung and cardiac health. We're gonna look at bone and muscle health. And then we're gonna look at cancer risks. Like I said, nothing's new here. We're not, we're not really looking at anything new, new health concerns. It's just how quick these things come on and why they come on. And then the other things we're gonna look at too is vision, GI, so stomach issues, and even reproductive health. So why is brain, why, why is the brain important and how is the brain affected? Well, two of the things I really wanna hit on the brain is the ability to become addicted to a substance at such a young, young age. Now I know this graph right here reads alcohol and marijuana, but you see the spike at 14 to 21 years of age. So why is there this spike right here? The spike occurs because at that age, the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala in the brain are still developing. Because they're still developing, and you introduce a substance like nicotine into it, that nicotine becomes the new norm for that person. So once that new norm is established, they need more and more and more. So we see that, we know that, we know how addiction works. We know that there's the dopamine cascade that causes people to want more and more and more because you're never going to get back to that original high that you feel that first few times that you use it. We know this with cigarette smoking. We know that people who use cigarettes, they, they get that, that need for it. It's more intense with vaping. Second thing that I want to talk about with the brain health is that there is a damage to what's called the myelin sheath. So the myelin sheath is the protective coating that goes around each and every neural synapse. So each nerve that's in your brain, which is thousands upon thousands upon trillions of neural synapses, is covered by a myelin sheath. The more you introduce 
vaping and cigarette smoke and, and substances like nicotine into your body and brain, it wears away that myelin sheath. So not only do you impact the ability to make good decisions because you're introducing a substance at such a young age, you're now damaging the brain. You're, you're literally damaging the brain at that nerve, uh, nerve ending, and that is never repaired. So people who are in massive car accidents, traumatic brain injuries, those things are injured because of trauma, and they never get those things back. It's the same with vaping. We know that the lungs are affected. And how are the lungs affected? We, we know that introducing smoke into the lungs damages the lungs at, at the different levels, at the bronchial, the alveoli, uh, within the esophagus and trachea. And we're also seeing the same disorders with vaping. And we're seeing them at an earlier age, correct? So we see the COPD, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So we get the wheezing, the coughing, the shortness of breath that's caused from smoking is caused from vaping as well. We're seeing an increase in both emphysema and pneumonia at younger ages. We're seeing an increase in tuberculosis. So these are older diseases that we thought we were getting rid of because cigarette smoke was going away. We, we knew those things were gonna go away with cigarette smoking, and then we've reintroduced vaping, and it has increased these older diseases that we thought we were gonna get rid of. Another one that we, I want to talk about with pneumonia is called lipid pneumonia. Anybody who knows what lipids are? Anybody's taking a health class? Yeah. So lipids are the fats. All right. Lipids are released when we eat things, when we eat bad things. We have fatty um, deposits. Because the coughing is so intense and then because the oil heats up in the lung, you see an increase in fluid and phlegm that gets stuck in there with the lipids in the lungs itself, which causes the person to cough, have a chronic cough, um, have the, the wheezing to try to get that out. They can't get that out, and that causes an inflammatory response which permanently damages the lungs. So you could see that inflammatory response, that, that cilia, the hair-like that, that is on the lung itself, how those are affected. And when those are affected, the lungs can't do their job. So those little hair-like structures are in there to protect the lungs, to stop those um, foreign bodies from going in there and, and affecting your ability to breathe and in, in, uh, inhale oxygen, good oxygen. That's damaged, and that goes away. One of the videos that we didn't include today because it was a little bit longer uh, included a, a young female who was seen in an AER. The first x-ray is on her right, or on your right, on your left, sorry. That is taken three days before the next x-ray, which is on your right. All that white, milky fluid is in the lungs because the body's fighting the infection that was brought up on by the smoking of the vape. So this young girl battled Death she, death, she was actually put into a, a coma to kind of help her breathe and survive. And that is just a three-day comparison. Luckily, they were able to bring her out. And uh, the only way they were able to bring her out is because her cousin mentioned to her mom that she smokes every single day. And the parents didn't realize it because they couldn't detect it like cigarette smoke can. We, we smell, we know the smell of cigarette smoke, but we don't know the smell of vaping, unless you're right there and you smell that very sweet stuff or that cotton candy, the flavors that you smell, you, you don't notice those things. And a lot of times people who vape don't associate that with smoking. They don't think it's smoking. People don't think it's smoking at all. But you absolutely experience the same things that happen when you smoke as when you vape. The next system that's really affected is your cardiac health. So your, your heart is, at, is, is affected by those things. When people get older, we're always concerned with arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis. So that's just the hardening of the heart vessels and the, the arteries. We also are worried about the things that are caught in the arteries as well. 
We see those in people who have bad diets, poor uh, living conditions, don't exercise. Well, you're seeing those things in the, in the younger population who vape, who continuously vape and, and chronically vape. Those onsets of those older diseases, per se, you see those a lot faster with the adolescents who vape. You see an increase in coronary heart disease. So like I said, those things that we see in an older population, we're seeing those at a younger population. And that is the weakening of the arteries that uh, go in and out of the, the, the heart. You see an increase in the heart rate and blood pressure. So now you have weakened structures. You have structures that are plugged up with certain things. You have weakened arteries. You have weakened vessels. And now you're asking those to work harder and harder to pump blood around the system. You lose the ability to do that when you vape. When you are vaping continuously, you lose the ability to do those things. And what happens when you lose those abilities? Things like aneurysms, internal bleeding from rupturing of those vessels, potential stroke. We're seeing students and, and, and adolescents go into the emergency room for potential strokes, and we don't know why. Or they, at least they don't know why, because they don't associate vaping as a negative habit or as the same as cigarette smoke. And unfortunately, we have seen deaths. Um, Carol, what was the last, the amount of deaths we've? About 35. About 35 this year. And that increased, I think, the last time I looked at it, um, like two months ago, it's doubled since then. So we're seeing a massive increase, an exponential increase in deaths associated with vaping. So my background is, is athletic training, sports medicine, and, and when we look at certain things, we look at the bone and, bone and muscle health and, and why am I concerned with vaping as, uh, as a health, health concern aside from the pulmonary and cardiac issues. Well, anybody who likes to be active and people who aren't active even, their bones and muscles are important. When you are introducing vaping, you're decreasing the amount of oxygen that is reaching the lungs, which reaches the rest of your body through those systems because those are negatively affected. With the reduce of oxygen, you have an absolute reduced rate of recovery. So even if you are sedentary and you're continuously vaping, your ability to have a better day, your ability to just get up and walk to class or get up and, and make it to the car is reduced because you're not recovering from the day before. There's an increased rate of osteoporosis. So you're not getting oxygen-rich blood to those bones as they try to heal and recover and, and uh, return. You're, you're reducing that rate, which leads to osteoporosis because you're not able to load those bones like you would to help them grow, which will lead to osteoporosis. You, redu you, you have a reduction of the neuromuscular activity. Remember when we talked about the myelin sheath? Now, it's not only affected in the brain, it's also affected in the muscle systems as well. You have myelin uh, sheath covered, covered nerves that reach the, the muscles as they are active. You take that ability away and you have what's called atrophy of the muscles. Your muscles do not grow stronger, they don't grow bigger. So anybody who is active, you're not able to participate at that rate that you want to. Uh, not only because you're not getting the oxygen rich blood, you're not getting the uh, neural pathways that are connected to the muscles firing, you're not getting the oxygen to help it be powered. Injury rate for smokers versus non-smokers. And this is, this is general injury rate. You see you know, the sprained ankles, the, the bumps and bruises. The rate of injury for smokers is 12.9% versus 7.2% in, um, in, in the general population. So people who smoke, people who vape, have a greater increase rate of injury. And even more concerns. We talked about that in the beginning. We still see that cancer is a risk for vaping and smoking. Esophageal cancer, mouth cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer. Some of the other things that you're seeing too that I didn't include on this, when it comes to mouth throat cancer, you're also seeing herpes increased. Why do we see herpes increase? Anybody have an idea why we're seeing herpes increase in vaping? They're sharing it, right? How many times have we caught kids with one vape between six, seven people? If somebody's sick or has something, they're using it and 
and, and giving it and sharing it to other people. We're taught at a young age not to share certain things, right? So why are we sharing things that we're, are going to lead to further diseases like those? One of the things that you'll see, too, with uh, other concerns is the gastrointestinal tract is affected because when you introduce smoke, it's also eliciting a acid reflux. So that GERD uh, that you see in an older population, once again, you're seeing that in a younger population where kids are actually having acid reflux problems because the, uh, the, the nicotine in the vape is actually affecting the stomach if it hits the stomach versus the lungs. So you see kids walking around asking for Tums, uh, and you, you kind of have to wonder why students young, so, so young are asking for Tums. Because there's a reduction in oxygen, there's a reduction of oxygen to the brain and to the eyes, so you're seeing vision problems occurring a lot faster in the younger age. We also see reproductive health issues. And then the other things that we see, too, are the immune system. Now, we talked about the sharing of the vape, which leads to uh, herpes and other things and, and cancer risks. Well, as you're going about these things and, and using substances like a vape and nicotine, it reduces your body's ability to heal itself because of the toxins and the chemicals that are found in the vapes. And I know Carol covered those earlier, the amount of substances that you don't even know that are in vapes because they're not covered or they're not monitored, you're introducing those to your body and you're asking your body to fight those certain things and you're not able to. One of the things I, did, I didn't add on there too was, um, was sleep. Sleep's a very important thing when it comes to recovery and, uh, and immune health. Our newest recommendation is eight full hours of REM sleep. Now, a lot of us don't get that overall because we have our pocket phone or we have our phones. Uh, we're not getting true REM sleep for eight full hours. A lot of us prioritize certain things. We don't have time for sleep sometimes. But when you introduce a substance like vaping and nicotine, which is a stimulant, it keeps the body up a lot longer, doesn't allow you to get that perfect amount of sleep, that REM sleep, and it reduces the ability to fight off infections, fight off inflammation, and then help your body recover as well. So why is, this all, why is this so important? Well, we talked about introducing terrible substances like this. And we see that these things are very similar to smoking. We, we, they're the exact same thing. I think when I started going through this and putting together this presentation, I wanted to see if there's anything new. And it's nothing new. It, it's, it's the same stuff we've been talking about with smoking. It's just now more intense. You're taking a jewel pod, which is very small, and the perception is that that's not a lot, when that's actually a, sm a pack of cigarettes. So every time you hit it, one, one inhalation is like smoking a full cigarette within one inhalation. So you're introducing these chemicals so fast and so intense that your body doesn't know what to do with other than try to fight, fight those infections or fight that new substance, and you're really not giving yourself a fighting chance to recover from smoking vapes. So smoking in the past has given us a lot longer time to recover from those things. We are introducing these things so fast and so quick and so intensely that we're not giving ourselves a fighting chance when it comes to our own personal health, not only just at the lung and heart issue, but muscle and bone too. So, and I, I think I'll leave, if anybody has any questions that they want to ask, I'll leave that for the end. So, one of the things that um, we wanted to be sure and let everyone know is that we're here to help share information, but we also want to be able to address questions that anybody might have um, as a result of some of the things you've heard here tonight and or things that you've uh, come across in your own reading. So what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, Charlie Hollerith, AKA Mr. Hollerith, with a mic, um, walking around if you guys have any questions. Um, in addition, I believe that there were some note cards that people may have grabbed and uh, written down some questions. And if you have a note card, you can hold it up in the air and a friendly uh, BYA volunteer will come and grab it from you. So do we have it? So we have a question. Wonderful. Is this something that you guys put on for all the student body at, high, at the high schools? A similar presentation? We have it. 
we haven't given this presentation yet. When you look at the two hour slot, so we've been working on something, we have this video recorded, we have shorter segments, we've been giving pieces, but exactly what you said is, especially when you look at our number one tool from the school is helping kids realize how harmful this is, is to work on that, but it takes time. So we're also looking at where else that comes in the curriculum. One of the things we've discussed is we, it's very important for us to have a teen voice and presence in things that we put together. So this was kind of the first step in it. And we have a number of youth action board teens who are part of Bloomfield Hills High School. And I know John has some of his student athletes. And so we're gonna be pulling some of the teens together so that they can have input on what type of program would be most impactful for their fellow students. And I will add on to that, um, like Carol mentioned, BBCC has their Youth Action Board, and Bloomfield Youth Assistant has recently created a club called Real Talk, and the students that are participating in that are our eyes on the street to help us understand what type of messaging will resonate with them and what we can do as an organization and as a group to best help them in ways that will actually resonate. Um, so parents who are here, have your children reach out and get involved in any of those communities or talk with people who are part of those groups uh, because their voice matters and we wanna hear from them. Questions, I can't see anything. So the question is, I think this is a David one for, uh, for all of us in school administration. Kids tell me that they know which bathrooms kids go to to, to vape and, or get high. And they say that all the kids know. Um, in that case, what do we do for that when we know that that is going on in the bathrooms? Well, it's a struggle. And that's the first thing, and this is one of the difficulties. If you see, and when you talk with the students as well, when they're odorless, they're very, there are ones that don't discharge a large vapor, vapor. Being able to, in the moment, identify the students is very difficult. Aside from, so we spend a lot of time in rotations. We have all our staff going through the bathrooms, between classes, during classes, not sending kids in groups. And it's difficult if you compare to catching students smoking. It's just obvious, it's on your fingers, you can smell it, it's filling the whole room. So it's not pleasant, but a piece of my job is spending a significant amount of time in the bathrooms. We walk in, we're in there, and there's every time we're in there, and it's this thing of if they know, it's almost like chasing mice to the new cheese. They're going off to the next place, and it's very, very difficult to catch. When you find three or four kids in a stall, that's a sign something strange. But when there's a child in a stall, they could be right there vaping in the stall and it looks very much like they're going to the bathroom. And in fact, they possibly could be. So we've talked about, is there technology? What other pieces do you have? But we keep looping back to the fact that the kids have something driving them to go to the bathroom and vape. And it's another piece. So we're working on it. It's very difficult. It is remarkably hard to catch. It's remarkably hard. And, oh, I'm sorry, Charlie. Ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll add on one thing. I remember talking with a parent who said, why isn't the school doing more? And I, I realized that it's, and, and I'm a parent of a high schooler and a middle schooler, and I also happen to work with Bloomfield Youth Assistance, but it's, it's all of our issue. If it's hard to catch students in the high school, it's hard to catch children in our homes. It's, it's something that we all, that's why I always think knowledge is power. The more we all know, the more we can do our due diligence to try and eradicate it in all of the different places where our kids might be doing it. Right, I mean, to Denise's question, when is the last time every parent in here checked the ch your child's backpack? When's the last time you checked every piece of their bedroom? Or when they're going to the bathroom, you're in the bathroom with them, their pencil case. And I ask myself that very same question. I know this, when's the last time I checked my child's backpack? But that's, that's the extension of the question. I'm spending time in the bathroom with your child, are you? 
and it's a little, I may know more about your child's bathroom habits than you do because I'm in there checking what they're doing. This is a strange statement, <laughs> but it's true. And they didn't, they didn't get addicted to it in the bathrooms at our school. They're addicted to it, so they have to do it in the bathrooms at our school. They got addicted somewhere else, and they can't get away from this. If you see the power of these things, they were intentionally targeted by big companies who were dying to, they went straight after our children when their brains were most vulnerable and they just shot them with this nicotine delivery system knowing they'd get addicted. That slide that John had talking about the, the, the addiction rates of children, they know this. They know that better than we do. And they went straight at our children and now they're addicted. So it becomes a whole different issue when it's about an addiction. It's not, it's not any longer once you get to the high school about being cool. It's, it's a big piece about it is I can't go through the day without vaping because the headaches are too much. We have another question here in the back. Hi. Um, there was something in one of the slides about the correlation between stress and anxiety and I think like uh, depression and stuff like that in kids. Um, I was wondering if there's anything in um, like the curriculum to help them deal with that stuff. Maybe mindfulness or um, tools to help them work on some of that stuff. Yes. Yeah, um, we actually are implementing a new health curriculum this year called Prepare You. Uh, and Prepare You focuses a lot on mental health, uh, mental wellness, and things like that. So that is a new curriculum that we've implemented this year that all freshmen will be exposed to. And we have a couple more questions that were submitted, if I could read. One is, how do you know if it's nicotine or THC in the vape? I, you'd have to test it. Um, we, we have testing kits that we use to test it, um, but you wouldn't know otherwise. This question, the next question, I think probably, John, for you and Jessica, and that is, do coaches, teachers, and club, uh, club advisors talk to students about vaping or know the risks? It, it is, it, right now, we are relying on the, uh, the, the new curriculum. Um, but because this has been so fast, and, and we are unfortunately being reactive to this because uh, the, the incident rate of this has been so, uh, so high, we really didn't know anything about this to, to go ahead of it. Yes, we did know rumblings of it. We, we, we watched it a little bit, um, but we're not the only ones. We're not the only community that is dealing with this um, in unfortunately a reactive way, uh, but we are relying on the newer curriculum. Uh, we are also um, educating our coaches as well as to this uh, new substance because our coaches are in the locker rooms as well, and it's unfortunately another spot where students are using um, and, and are getting caught. Um, it's just the coaches may not be aware of what they're walking into, uh, and it does dissipate incredibly fast. So. A coach could walk through the locker room, it could occur while they're there, and they may not, they may not even know about it. Uh, and that's the same as uh, in the restrooms as well. Uh, and, and even walking in the hallways, there's, I've, I've heard plenty of kids, you know, say, I'm walking and I just kind of see a puff of smoke and there could be a group of kids, we don't know who it is, we can't pinpoint that unless we actually catch them in the act. One of the questions uh, that I often get is, where do I turn to for help? And Carol, maybe you could talk about some of the resources of the BBCC and as, as a parent, how do I talk to my, my student about this and where might I turn to for help? Well, first of all, if it is a Bloomfield Hills High School student, we have the alternative to suspension program here, which I don't think we talked about yet, did we? Oh, um, Very little. I Yes, she did. Um, but I remember no, that. Yes. No, so, we, can, we can talk more about it, for sure. Yeah. So that is one option that instead of 
them getting suspended because we know that you cannot suspend your way out of an addiction. And so that way, they go through this program, like Denise said, it's about 30 days. There's a number of different touch points along the way. All of us are a touch point, youth assistances. We integrate, it's a reflective time for them. I know when, at my part, when I tell them, I, I say, hey, you know, let's use this as a reset. This is a reset for you to take time to reflect on the choices you've made and are they in alignment with who you want to be and where you want to go. And that's where the Covey 7 Habits comes in. And then they also meet with youth assistance, a social worker, because we want to make sure there's not other underlying issues going on where so often when we piloted the alternative suspension program back in 2015, 2014, 13, in there, whenever it was, we had um, 23 students go through it and only one didn't make it all the way through. Um, we found that there were other things going on in the home. And this way it's not being punitive, but it's trying to catch addiction early enough on that you can make a difference. Because if you think about it, the drinking and other things like that, when you get into your later years, it's very, very difficult to quit. So let's start now. So that's number one. Number two, if you go um, to bbcoalition.org, we have on our resources tab, there's an actual um, pamphlet that you can open up. It's a PDF. And the ACHC, Alliance of Coalitions for Healthy Communities, is kind of an umbrella organization for all the prevention coalitions in Oakland County. All of those resources have been vetted. Um, especially when you're dealing with vaping, it hasn't been very simple because there are smoking cessation alone doesn't seem to do the trick because there's so many other social issues that go into it. And if there's not THC involved, you can't go to like a maple grove. However, there are places like Rivers Bend, there's um, private practitioners, Anna Kassar, and others out there who are working with, you wanna look at addiction, dual diagnosis, there's probably a mental health piece that also goes along with it. One of the best things is, is because each person is so different. Each person's reason for why they made the choice and they crossed the line to do it is different, even within a family. And so you need to put the right support system in place. And it's generally not just one person. Definitely reach out to youth assistance. They are an amazing resource um, to go to. There's just really so many. And I know that on bloomfield.org, there's resources there too. Is that? Yes. Okay. And we have another question here. Good evening. Uh, I just have a question for, it's probably more from a physical standpoint, but how long would the traces of, let's say, nicotine, THC, remain in the body? And the reason I ask is, I mean, is a, is a blood test for a physical, are those things that would pick up if you asked the doctors to specifically check for those items? I mean, I know back in the day, you know, people had to get drug tested for work and THC stayed in your system for 30 days or what, I don't know all the, the dates, but you know, if you have a youth that you suspect or even just want to know how long or what traces of nicotine or what traces of THC would remain in the bloodstream and, and for how long? Generally up to 45 days, depending on the um, amount of THC, the potency. Hair follicle is probably one of the better ways if you really want to get really in-depth results, and there are other ways. But that's the problem now that a lot of young people don't realize is there's many businesses ever since the medical, the marijuana went from medical marijuana to recreational marijuana, that even for some really basic jobs in retail, they are doing drug screenings. Yeah, no, well, absolutely. I, I just, I know that because of that, drug testing and everything, there were ways that people would mask it and what have you. But the traces of nicotine and THC, if they're in your child's system, it's probably a pretty good indication that they're vaping. I, I mean, it's not right. coming from secondhand smoke or thirdhand smoke. It's going to be uh, basically an addiction of, of, of vaping, I would imagine. That... Right, right. And that's the, you also think of it this way. If you have any suspicion, what John and I were talking earlier, opposed to other things that are high interest or are high risk to students, like so the alcohol, 
you can say that drinking and having these weekend parties and maybe sampling could lead to addiction. But with vaping, it is a will lead to. So if you have any of those signs where you get the coughing, you got the sudden change in sleep patterns, just go to the pediatrician, go get checkups. You're going to see things that shouldn't be showing up at their age around health. If you're noticing those pieces, that could be it. If you're noticing some of the other signs, and then you treat it like it's either on the way to or is an addiction. And then you look at some of those addiction treatments. But the other one, the nicotine can be tougher, but looking for changes in behavior and really looking for signs of unhealthiness that are chronic. They're lasting much longer than they should. One of the things, if you um, go to our Facebook page and you go to the video about SEMA, it was the one that Jen mentioned was a little bit longer. She talks about, she was um, 18 years old in California. She was in and out of many ERs and many doctor's offices, each time telling them that she used vapes. So the reason, what I, the reason I'm bringing this up is that not all physicians are up to date and savvy in all of this, kind of like you go back to the whole opioid epidemic where, you know, it was the doctors that because they were getting rated on how they brought your pain down, they were the ones who were giving the painkillers. So we're in a process now with our whole medical um, community of re-educating the physicians in terms of this new world we're living in. So you just need to, um, ask some discerning questions or come straight out and talk to them, you know, and let them know your concerns because they may not pick up on it or they may not think it's a big deal. And, and, the, and the term Evali that Carol had talked about, that's two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a new term that we just came up with in the medical realm two weeks ago. So that's how fast and, and behind, unfortunately, we are with this, uh, with this delivery system, is it's two weeks ago that we just termed it. Well, and to that, 2014, we were like, "What is this?" 2017, we knew we had an epidemic. 2019, kids are dying. Mm -hmm. That's how fast this thing is moving. And so we're 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 really having to like do the best we can to catch up. But it's incredibly powerful and fast. Denise, we have another question. Yes. Sure. Uh, for the vaping, how do you compare the Michigan state to other states in the country? And the uh, second question, we, we saw here in the high school the trends, the negative trends. How is it in the colleges? This is something, vaping is, you can run but you can't hide. It's in every state, it's in every school. Uh, it's even worse in college. Um, although we have heard some reports that there is a little bit of a shift starting to go on where some of the college students are starting to say, hey, this is dumb, um, but not quick enough because unfortunately what we end up seeing with a number of the substances is when our children go away to college, it actually gets a little bit of out of control because it's their first time away, the first time on their own, but this is a pro this problem with vaping nationwide. We have a couple of questions back here. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, sort of along the same vein, um, I'm wondering at the high school, how many have been caught over whatever term since the beginning of school or whatever? Um, how many pick the three-day suspension versus the alternative program. And maybe you can talk just a little bit more about the alternative program. How long does it last and what, what, what do the students do? So the vaping is our number one um, discipline issue at the school. Without going into the particular numbers, you think about all the things we'd have in a school of 1,800 kids, vaping's the number one. So to deal with that, knowing that one, we have an epidemic, and two, we know that suspending kids from school doesn't deal with the behavior and often puts students in a bad place. If you also see that that's an addiction is often driving this, we have to treat this differently. So we've worked really hard in coming up with this alternative suspension program and the program does involve that your suspension and your participation in after school activities would be held in abeyance 
if you go through the program. Program takes about a month to complete where you have an education component, you have meetings with everybody you see here as well as Officer Dave, with your counselor, you have um, a presentation that you give afterward where you go through some of this. So it's in, in a sense, it's a lot of work. And it's more work than just going and sitting home for the three days. Fortunately, we have an incredibly educated and supportive community with the parents, and they know that each day out of school is actually really impactful to your school and to your grades and to your learning. I mean, that the more time you're out. So three days is a lot. So we've not had anybody yet who's turned down that opportunity, and we're hoping we can continue, because a lot of that's in the packaging of the opportunity. This is about putting you in a place to make healthier choices, and this is about having a turnaround in your life and going from it, and it really does involve, it's this, it's, it's this whole group here. It doesn't work if the parent's like, nah, I'm gonna just take my three days. You know, you're telling me the kid has like some, maybe a major life uh, health risk going on here. So we've had incredible support from the parents. Like, yes, absolutely, let's do this. They may not know, and this kind of thing is helping us understand, we've gotta get even to the parents more. We've gotta get more of this information to the parents. We need to be working together to help them also with us deliver the information and look for signs with the student. I mean, and we got some questions we need to have with each other. Like, we're the generation of parents who have to face these crazy new addictions. Social media, cell phones, vaping. These are not addictions we're trained to handle. What are we supposed to do as parents? Do I really look through my child's email? Yep. Do I really look through their social media? I do. Do I go through their backpack for vaping? I have to. That's a weird place for us to be as parents. We need to work together in this. We are the first generation of parents to face this type of problem. But again, a lot of people are in high support of it and it's something that we're working on and we believe in. We've got another question here, Denise. Yeah, no, say with alcohol addiction, a lot of times you know, kids or adults go through a detox. What are some of the symptoms that kids go through when they try to take themselves off uh, these e-cigarettes or the vaping? What kind of symptoms do they have? Or Well, there's definitely um, nausea, vomiting, uh, flu-like flu symptoms. And that's one of the things that um, coming up to this whole flu and pneumonia and everything season we are coming up with is that those who have the Adivali, who have the impaired lungs, they're going to be more susceptible. But it's very similar to um, in terms of detoxing off of other substances. Once again, it depends on the person. Um, but as you can see that some of the young people who were in crisis, they actually had to be put on ventilators and things like that. So once again, it's you know the body aches, flu-like symptoms, headache, difficulty breathing, things like that. And it also speaks to the intensity of the vape itself. Now we know that one person, if you smoke a cigarette, Usually it takes about 24 hours or so for that, uh, the, the alveoli to, to repopulate, the cilia to kind of repopulate in the lungs itself. But unfortunately, nobody just smokes a cigarette, waits 24 hours for their body to become healthy again, and then smokes another one. It's that constant addictive uh, trait that is driving them to smoke more. Because vapes are so intense, that reaction is worse. So now you get the heavy coughing, the wheezing, the what we call rails, which is like a crackling sensation or sound when they breathe. You hear that and you see those things a lot more frequently and faster um, while the user uses uh, a vape. So if they go off of those things, you see the things that Carol had spoke about and then you see the respiratory uh, responses linger a lot longer because the body's still recovering from that inflammatory uh, process of healing their its lungs. Just takes a lot longer. And I think we have time for one more final question in the back. Yeah, uh, along the lines of the, the health issues that go with it, have you at the school seen any specific health issues related to kids vaping, coming to the clinic, you know, being sick, that sort of thing from it? here locally? I know I'll speak personally from uh, the athletic standpoint. Um, we have not. We've been lucky enough that uh, the incident rate for our student athletes uh, has been a lot lower. Um, athletics tends to be a, a protective factor uh, when it comes to substances like this. 
Um, but we haven't, on my end, haven't seen anything similar to that. I'll let you speak to the general population. I don't know, David. I mean, I, I think that, I don't, I don't think we have any actual data for that um, that we could speak to. Yeah, ours, in terms of the health, and like you see those flu-like symptoms in that piece, ours is about the getting up and leaving to go to the bathroom, being out of the classroom. So working with the parents and the teacher to have like, my, my kid can't leave, something else is going on. Or um, the, the other one when you say like, what is a sign that you, your child is vaping? That nicotine hit is so intense, they, don't, they almost look like they're high in the 1980s way. Because um, it's got a little bit of a kind of a marijuana look to the students, kind of glassy eyes. Uh, looking a little bit off, looking a little bit out of it. So when we talk to the teachers and they're describing, God, you just seem kind of out of it. I know he went to the bathroom and they're saying they're just sick because they're coughing. We're, we're picking up on that, but it isn't so much of missing school. It's really linking these things together and having all these signs and that you're like, oh, something's <coughs> going on. And really, ultimately, the only way that you have definitive proof is when the child has a vape pen on them and it's going through the backpack, checking their pockets, you see them have it in their hand, and that usually helps precipitate the conversation because a lot of the students, they, they know that they shouldn't be doing it, but somehow they've all been convinced that it's really not that dangerous. And when you look at it, I mean, if you just think of it, it's probably running through your brains, imagine smoking a cigarette in one hit. I mean, we know you can't do it. Imagine smoking an entire pack of cigarettes in about a half an hour as a 13-year-old. You couldn't do it. Your lungs weren't ready for it. They'd be burning. You'd be coughing and throwing up after three or four cigarettes. But this vape device was so well made that a 13-year-old could actually smoke a pack of cigarettes and get it in. That, that's what's so amazing about it. So it's really wrecking their system fast, and it's throwing them off. And again, I think that's probably our number one piece that we're noticing is they're just, they don't seem with it. They seem off. Something's not right but they don't smell you, smell a little sweet, put in a piece of bubble gum in your mouth, and you're like, oh, I'm just chewing my bubble gum, what's going on? So it, it's really tough. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to take this time to sort of elaborate just a little bit. I know sometimes there can be some confusion because there are so many good community organizations out there, and there are so many acronyms that I'll admit that even I sometimes, like BHHS, BYA, BBCC, so the, each of us overlap in this area right here. I think you thought of a Venn diagram. We all are in the middle together as community partners. Carol mentioned earlier that Bloomfield Youth Assistance, that we have a caseworker that is part of the services that we offer as an organization. And without going into a lot of detail, um, if you have any questions about what Bloomfield Youth Assistance does, you can reach out to me. My email address is BYA president at gmail.com, or any of the administrators can put you in touch with either me or with Carol, um, who's the executive director of BBCC, um, and we'd be happy to explain more. But we absolutely do have a caseworker at BYA, and that is through, we have several different sponsors. One of them is Bloomfield Hills Schools. One of them is the Oakland County Circuit Court Family Division, and the other is the Township of Bloomfield Hills. So we do have a caseworker. Um, who is working with the students who opt to go into the alternative to suspension program. Um, Charlie? And, and if I could just, uh, if you could join me in thanking our panelists tonight, uh, my administrative team, John Seco, Carol, and Denise, and Kelly, and Liz, and all the people. We're so thankful to have these community agencies supporting our work here. And, like you said, it's a community effort. And uh, the other thing I wanted to let you know too, this presentation tonight is being videotaped. So for those of you who weren't, had people that couldn't attend tonight and wanna see this, we'll be posting this on our website. So please direct them to our homepage. Also on the high school homepage, there is a tab called Family Resources. Underneath that, you will see links to the BBCC, the BYA, vaping and all these topics that uh, we talked about tonight and all the health risks associated uh, with it. So thank you uh, all for coming. The other thing I just wanted to put a plug in as I look out in the audience, I want to thank the students for coming tonight. Here, here. That, speaks, that speaks volumes of uh, the issue because um, 
you are the ones that are going to make the biggest difference with your peers. Mm -hmm. And talking about that, talking about the health risks, and if you can convince one of your friends or group of friends to maybe not take the hit off that vape or use that vape, that's going to go a long way uh, working with our community agencies to making a true difference in this community. So again, thank you for coming out tonight. I know our panelists will stick around, so if you still have some specific questions, they'll answer them. But thank you and have a good evening.